In this video, we're going to learn how to name ionic compounds. And there's three types of ionic compounds that we're going to learn how to name. The first one are simple binary ionic compounds, and that just means there's only two elements involved in forming the compound. And then the next one is going to be binary ionic compounds that include a transition metal. So once again, we have two elements involved in making the compound, but we'll have a transition metal involved, and that's going to have an added twist to the naming system. And then we're going to look at ionic compounds that involve a polyatomic ion. So for each of these types, we're going to look at examples of how to go from a formula to a name, and then we'll learn how to go back the other way from the name to the formula. So in an ionic compound, we're going to have uh, compounds that are composed of ions, of cations and anions. So that's positively charged ions and negatively charged ions that are sticking together. And in general, this is going to be a compound that's formed when a metal bonds with a nonmetal. So to kind of follow along with this video, you're going to want to get yourself a periodic table, maybe pull one up on your computer so you have that to reference. We're going to be needing to look at that periodic table so we can find the names of these different elements. So let's start with, again, these simple binary ionic compounds. So we have three examples that we'll take a look at here. I'm going to pull up my periodic table so I can reference that as I look how to name these compounds. I generally like to break things down into a series of steps that I can follow when I'm, when I'm working through something like naming compounds. So when we're working with these simple uh, binary compounds, uh, we can follow these set of steps. First, we'll write the name of the cation, exactly how it appears in the periodic table. And then we'll write the name of the anion, and then we're going to change the ending of the anion's name to ide, I-D-E. So let's take a look at these three. And we'll again reference our periodic table so we uh, know the names of these elements. So the first one here, we have Na and Cl. So if you have your periodic table, go ahead and look at that so you can find Na, which is right here. So that is sodium. So step one is that we're just going to write the name of that cation. So the first element in the compound is always the cation. Next we'll look at the Cl on the periodic table. That's right here. It's chlorine. And so again I'm going to change the ending. Instead of chlorine I'm going to write chloride. So sodium chloride. So pretty simple. These Again these are the easiest ones. They're the simple binary compounds. Uh, let's move to the next one here. So we have MgO. So if you look at your periodic table, find Mg right here. That's magnesium. So we'll write the name of that cation, magnesium. And then we have oxygen over here. And again, I'm going to change that ending to oxide. And then move on to the last one here. We have Ca which is right here, that's calcium. And then over here we have fluorine, so we'll change that to fluoride, and we have calcium fluoride. So one uh, thing to remember with naming these types of compounds is that we don't actually have to ever worry about the amounts of each of these compounds. So. Uh, we'll take a look at why that is here as we go the other direction and we move from the name to the formula. So this is a little bit more challenging uh, to do this, but um, we're just kind of going in reverse here of what we were doing with the other example. So what we want to do in this case is we're going to find the symbols of these. And since these are ionic compounds, that means they are oppositely charged compounds that are uh, attracting to one another. So when we put the formula together, when we put these two symbols together, we have to look at the charges of each of these ions and balance out those charges. So the total positive charge, remember this is the positive ion, has to be equal to the total negative charge. And we can multiply or add more of each element to get those charges to balance. So let's see how that works here. So first we'll look up cesium here, cesium. Cesium is in group 1, and everything in group 1 is going to form a ion with a positive 1 charge. Things in group 2 will be a positive 2 charge. These are the transition metals. We're going to skip those. We'll save those for a little bit later here. This is group 3. 
everything in group 3 will have a 3 plus charge. These guys right here in group 4, they don't generally form ions, so we're going to skip them. Over here, group uh, 5, these are going to form ions with a negative 3 charge. Here in group 6, negative 2 charge. Group 7, negative 1 charge. And then these are the noble gases, they don't form ions. So let's find cesium and oxygen. So cesium's here, group 1. It's going to have a plus 1 charge. And then we'll look up oxygen. Oxygen's over here in group 6. It means that it has 6 valence electrons. It wants to have 8, so it's going to gain 2. That's going to give it a 2 minus charge. So there's our two ions involved. So I need them to balance, and they don't balance. I have plus 1 and 2 minus. If I brought in another cesium, that's going to give me a total of 2 plus charge. So in my formula, I want to identify the symbol and the amount of each involved. So I had two cesiums and just one oxygen. So there is my formula for cesium oxide. Next one here is aluminum chloride. So here is aluminum. It's in group three. It's going to have a three plus charge. And chloride is right here in group seven. It's going to have a minus one charge. So I'm going to need three of these chlorides in order to balance out that three plus charge. So I'm going to write aluminum. I only have one of them. And Cl3. And then the last one here, potassium bromide. And we can find potassium here. It's in group one. So it is going to have a one plus charge. And then we have bromide, which is right here, group seven. All of these have a minus one charge. And so they are already balanced, so I just need one of each potassium bromide, just like that. All right, the next series of elements here are going to be elements that involve a transition metal. So remember that transition metals are these metals that appear in the middle of the periodic table. And what's special about transition metals is that transition metals, they don't follow um, <clears throat> that, that rule of having a set charge. So for example, in group one, everything there has a plus one charge. Everything here has a two plus charge. But these guys, they can take on a number of different charges. So iron, for example, we're gonna see iron twice here. Iron can have a lot of different charges. It could be plus one, plus two, plus three. And we have to identify in the name uh, what kind of iron or what the charge is of that transition metal. So the steps are the same when we, when we name these. The only difference is that we're going to add in a, uh, a part of the name that's going to tell us what the charge is. So step one, write the name of the cation. Step two, write the name of the anion and change the ending to ide. And then the third step, this is the extra step, only for transition metals. We're going to add a Roman numeral after the name of the cation to identify the charge on that cation. So let's see how that works. First, we have iron and oxygen. So iron's right here, Fe is iron, and then oxygen. Whenever I see the first element in the compound uh, is a transition metal, if it's here in the center, I have to figure out what the charge is. So... The way I do that is I look at what the anion is. And in this case, the anion is oxygen. Here's oxygen. It's in group six, so it has a two minus charge. And then I can look over and see how many cations are attached to that. So how many are balancing out? Well, there's only one iron. So therefore, the charge on iron has to be two plus because the total positive charge has to equal the total negative charge. So in my name, I want to identify that this is iron 2 plus. So I'm going to go ahead and just do the first two steps here. Where I write the name of the cation, write the name of the anion, change the ending to ide, and then I'm going to go ahead and identify the charge by using that Roman numeral. So this happens to be iron 2 oxide. So the next one here, I have iron and chloride. So this is 
right here, chlorine. Now, chlorine is in group 7, has a negative 1 charge, but there are 3 of them. So that means the total negative charge is 3 minus. We have just this one iron, and so the charge on iron has to balance out the charge over here, the total negative charge. So that means the charge on iron has to be 3 plus. So in this case, we're going to have iron and chloride. And then I could put the charge on iron here in Roman numerals. We have iron 3 chloride. So you can see the charges on these two irons are different. All right, and the next one here, actually, I'm going to change this slightly. I'm going to make it slightly more difficult here. I'm going to make this MN2O3. So we have two of these magnesiums and then three of these oxygens over here. So I'll go ahead and start with those first two steps here. I'll write the name of the cation. This is manganese. And then I have oxide. And then I have to figure out what is the charge on the manganese. Well, I always start over here with the anions. Now, oxygen's here, group 6, so it has a 2 minus charge. There are 3 of them. So that means I have 6 minus total. It's a total negative charge. Now, I have 2 manganese, and they have to balance out that 6 minus charge. So the charge on manganese has to be 3 plus because I have 2, so 3 plus times 2 is going to give me 6 plus, which is going to balance out the 3 minus. So this is manganese 3 oxide. All right, going the other way I think is a little bit easier. And to go this way, we're going to look at the, uh, the name uh, and match it up to the symbol on the periodic table so we can find those symbols. So the first one here, titanium, is Ti. Sulfur right here um, would be where sulfide is coming from. And titanium, in this case, has a 4 plus charge. So what we need to do, what I like to do, is just kind of write down the symbol and the charges and then try to uh, see how they balance each other out. So I have 4 plus on the titanium. And sulfur's over here. Group 6, it has a 2 minus charge, just like that. And then I can see how many of each do I need to get it to balance. So I'm going to need an extra sulfur in order to get it to balance out to that 4 plus. So when I write it, I'm going to say Ti, I'd only need one of those, S2. Next one here, I have copper 1 oxide. So copper is here with a Cu and has a plus one charge, that's what that Roman numeral means. Oxygen has a two minus charge, so I'm gonna need two coppers, and then just the one oxygen. And then the last one here, uh, I got manganese five chloride, so manganese is Mn, and we're saying it has a five plus charge. Chloride has a minus one charge, and so I have one manganese, and I'm gonna need five of these chlorides in order to balance out the charge in that manganese. All right, the next one or the last one here is ionic compounds that involve a polyatomic ion. Polyatomic ions are ions that are composed of a group of atoms that are bonded together. And so polyatomic, uh, the root word here poly, means many. So it's a many atom ion. So this is an example, sulfate is SO4, it's a sulfur bonded of four oxygens, and together this group has a two minus charge. This is very much like um, having just oxygen, an oxygen ion has a two minus charge. So these, these would act and bond in, in the exact same way. It's the charge that's the important thing here. And so for example, if I had a compound composed of magnesium, and magnesium is a group two metal, so it has a two plus charge. And I bond that magnesium to oxygen. I'm only gonna need one of each. And so the compound that forms is gonna be MgO. Now if the magnesium bonds to sulfate, once again, the charge is balanced. So I only need one magnesium and one sulfate. 
just like that. But what about something like this if I had um, maybe aluminum, which has a three plus charge as a group three metal bonding with sulfate? Well, in this case, I'm going to need to get these charges to balance. And so I'm going to look for the lowest common multiple between three and two. So that would be six. So if I had two aluminums, right, the total charge there would be six plus. If I had three sulfates, we'll just say times three, I would get six minus. So the way I would write that is I would have Al2, and then I need to show that I have three sulfates. So if I just wrote sulfate and then put a three on the outside, well, that doesn't really work because that's telling me that I have 43 oxygen. So what we do is we put brackets around the sulfate, and that tells me that there's three of everything inside of those brackets. Okay, so let's try some examples here. So first one, we have um, calcium and we have CO3. Now, notice all, all these polyatomic ions, we have all sorts of different ones. And there are many lists of polyatomic ions. If you um, look online, you're going to see a number of different lists that involve polyatomic ions. Most chemistry students are going to be required to memorize those lists. And if you just look up a list online, you're going to find um, pretty well the same thing all, all, um, you know, in any of those lists. So what I would do is I'd, I'd look one up and I'd find a good list of polyatomic ions and use that as a reference guide. But um, most likely you're going to want to learn these common ones and have those memorized. So I'm going to give you the names of these three, but there are, there are a lot of other ones as well that you'll find on those lists. So for these ones, they're really, really simple. We just go back to our original rules um, that we we're using for our other ionic compounds. And so we write the name of the cation, and then we write the name of the anion. Notice that I didn't include the part about changing the ending to I. We don't need to do that. We just leave the name of that polyatomic ion just as it is. Now I will note that if a transition metal is involved, we do need to still identify the Roman numeral for the charge. So the first one here, calcium and CO3 is called carbonate. Now calcium is a group two metal, so it does not uh, need a Roman numeral because it's not a transition metal. And then I can just write carbonate for the name of the polyatomic ion. Next one here is iron and NO3 is called nitrate. And iron, remember, is a transition metal, so we do have to identify the charge. Now the charge on nitrate is a minus one charge. You'll find that on your list of polyatomic ions. NO3, little minus one. And there's two of them, so that means two of everything inside. So we have two nitrates, which means the total negative charge would be two minus. That means the charge on iron must be uh, two plus to balance that out. So we have iron and nitrate. And again, charge on iron has to be two plus. And then the last one here, we have sodium. Sodium is a group one metal, not a transition metal. And then PO4 is called phosphate. So I can just write the name of the cation, sodium, and then phosphate. Again, no need for a Roman numeral because we don't have a transition metal. And then lastly, we'll go the other direction. And so the first one here, copper one nitrate. So copper is the symbol Cu. We're saying it has a plus one charge with that Roman numeral. Nitrate is NO3, with a minus one charge. Notice that they are balanced. So we only need one of each in our formula. Next one, magnesium phosphate. So magnesium is a group two metal, has a two plus charge in phosphate. We learned that one in the previous example, has a three minus charge. And we're gonna need those to balance. So to get the lowest common multiple here, we can um, use six, right? So we'll need two phosphates. We'll need three magnesium, so Mg three, and then we need two of these phosphates. And remember, we have to put those parentheses around phosphate to indicate that there's the two. And then the last one, lithium carbonate. Lithium is a group one metal, so there's a plus one charge. Carbonate has a two minus charge, so it's CO3, two minus. So we're gonna need two lithiums in order to balance out that charge, just like that. And so that is how to name 
ionic compounds.